Hey guys, welcome back to Home Built, and this week we are going to start tearing a bit deeper into the Ferrari engine. Alright guys, those of you watching the last few weeks will have seen that I finally finished my headers for the Alfa Ferrari and they fit, sort of, just. There's not a lot of space, but they're in there. Um, that means we can finally start moving forward onto the other systems of the engine and there's a lot of planning that needs to be done. I spent all day yesterday, an entire day, working on uh, some of the planning. It's, it's, it's such a detailed thing to try and go through and fit all of these systems into the car because at the moment we still haven't touched the, uh, the cooling system, the dry sump system, the charging system. There's, there's a lots, of, lots of bits and pieces that we need to have a look at. So let's get the engine back out and uh, I think it's time to start tearing into it a bit. All right, so engine's back out again. And um, actually, uh, one of you gave a great suggestion, was asking why I wasn't putting the engine onto my lift table that I've got. Uh, when I take it in and out of the car and I was just putting it on the ground. And the main reason was because I didn't even think of it. So uh, thank you for that suggestion. That was, uh, yeah, saves my back. Um, so let's now have a little bit more of a look at how the Ferrari engine functions. So what we, one of the, uh, the big things I've been looking at on this engine is the cooling system. Now, this is the water pump for the engine here and it is a massive, really complicated unit. They are insanely expensive. It's far more complicated than I need on this car. Behind it, this here is actually a heat exchanger. So this is a heat exchanger for the gearbox. So um, these two lines connected up to the gearbox oil and the gearbox oil ran through here. So it's a water to oil heat exchanger uh, on the top of the engine. I don't need that anymore. So that's got to come off. I want to simplify all of this. So I'm going to tear it down. Let's. Uh, get into it now and take this uh, water pump off and the heat exchanger off and uh, start having a look at what we have left. Hey, hey. Uh. At least the coolant is a nice bright green. <laughs> That's good to see. It's nice and clean inside. There might be some surface rust around here, but at least, um, yeah, the water galleries look nice and tidy. So you can see here, there's the uh, heat exchanger. You can see straight through it. So the water travels straight through there. The oil travel around the outside and uh, that's how this is cooled. So that is uh, no longer needed and one of the benefits and one of the reasons why I bought a complete Ferrari engine with everything is that these bits are all valuable. So the water pump, this, it's all valuable stuff that I can resell and uh, hopefully make back some of the expense of buying this very expensive engine. All right, so I've just spent a bit of time now actually trying to suss out the direction of water flow on this engine. Now, um, I had to sort of stop and think about it. There's uh, plenty of diagrams on how the oil flow works on this engine, but I can't find anything on the coolant flow. And um, I was just wrapping my head around this, so I thought I would explain it all to you guys as well. Most water pumps, the, uh, the water generally starts in the center of the pump and gets spun to the outside. So if you look at the shape of the pump, you can see here that uh, this hose here goes to the center of the pump that is actually where the return from the radiator comes from. This is the pressure side, uh, pressure outlet of the water pump. So on the, uh, the outer edge of its spin, its rotation, that's uh, pressurized in the engine. And this is the return, comes in here. While it's cold, the water will basically flow in here, back down and just, just rotate around inside the uh, water pump itself. When the thermostat opens up, this valve here, closes off the recirculating hole, and uh, that's how it all travels. Took me a while to get my head around that, but... Um... So in my case, I'm not going to be using this water pump because 
there's more stuff on it than I need, and also this thermostat is gonna get in the way. I'm not gonna be able to uh, lower my manifold to where I wanna lower it to with this all in place. And I have another solution. So after looking at uh, the packaging for this engine and making things um, simpler but also more efficient, I am opting for this, uh, which uh, Raceworks hooked me up with. This is a Davis Craig electric water pump. So this thing is good for big power cars. This is more than powerful enough to, uh, to deal with this engine. It's uh, possibly overkill. And the benefit of going with an electric water pump is you don't need a thermostat anymore because basically this will be controlled by the computer. You can get a, uh, a controller module if you don't want to, uh, if you don't have an aftermarket ECU, as I'm going to be using an aftermarket ECU on this engine, um, I'll be able to uh, set it up to control this. But basically you can control these motors so that when you are warming up the car, it just stays off. So the water inside the engine starts warming up and as the temperature uh, rises, you can just ease this on and have it going on intermittently and, uh, and just slowly and gradually build up as the uh, car heats up. And uh, if it starts getting really hot, you can get it going much faster and that's all programmable. You can do that, all that with this. Um, it's much simpler and I'm going to mount it right down low in the engine bay uh, out of the way. So I've got heaps of space up here the engine's so much cleaner without all this extra stuff on it. Um, so that is the way I'm going to go with this. So I still need to work out uh, how I'm going to uh, connect all these things back up again. But uh, that is for another time. For now, I'm going to uh, put the cover back on this. This definitely uh, is going to be getting a timing belt service and stuff when uh, I put it back in the car. But for the time being, let's uh, cover this back up and take you over the radiator and I'll show you what I'm going to do with that. Okay, so many of you have already seen that I already mounted the radiator for this project in the car. Uh, this was a custom made radiator by Saul at Mastello Parts in Italy, uh, who um, thankfully made this fantastic radiator that, that's, uh, that's enormous, and this should do the job nicely. I gave him all the specs to make the radiator as I wanted it, and because um, I didn't really know what I needed at the time, to be honest, uh, and now I'm going through and trying to package this Big engine in a tiny little engine bay, and I have to change things around. I've worked out now that for packaging, I need to have, instead of having the uh, the top on this side and the bottom on the other side, I need to swap them around. So I have to cut these off and make whole new mounts for the radiator, because basically the only place I can stick my electric water pump is actually down here in the uh, in the engine bay. So the electric water pump is going to come down here, and that runs from the uh, the bottom, the cold side of the radiator. So I need to cut this off, remake some mounts. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to put them on the clean side. So when I patch these up, they're going to be facing the radiator support. I'll make them as pretty as I can, but then I get the ugly bit facing away from uh, and uh, and hidden away. That brings me to my job for today, which is actually mounting up some fans to the radiator. So again, I reached out to Raceworks and uh, they hooked me up with a couple of uh, fantastic thermo fans. So these are slim enough that they're gonna fit inside the engine bay. So now I need to work out a way to actually fit them to the radiator and I could, in theory, just connect them straight to the, the radiator itself. But it's not very efficient. It's not a very efficient way to go. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a shroud out of uh, this nice big sheet of aluminum here. I'm gonna make up a shroud that these mount on so they suck all the air through these fans should uh, make them nice and efficient. So let's finally get me shutting up and uh, start work.
All right, a bit of cutting and folding, and we have my radiator fan shroud. This has uh, got just enough, enough depth to uh, be able to allow airflow, and I'm gonna mount my fans to this. And I had to do a little bit of trimming just to get it to sit onto the radiator, as the radiator is handmade. Um, it's trying to make sure and get everything square and sit perfectly, uh, perfectly straight. That is gonna look quite nice. Now uh, I'm going to actually attach it top and bottom, so I'm gonna have to put some of my favorite rivet nuts in. But uh, before I do that, I'm going to actually mount the fans up. All right, and there we go. We have my fans all mounted up nicely onto my shroud, and the shroud will sit onto the radiator like that. All I need to do now is just uh, drill out the edges and put in some rib nuts so that it can uh, be permanently mounted on there. I'm quite happy with that. That turned out great. And there we go, we've got the fans on the, on the radiator. Um, I'm really happy with that. That fan shroud has come out really nice. That is going to uh, do the job nicely. I will probably paint it black and so that the whole thing just sort of disappears into the engine bay. Um, I'm not making a feature out of it. I'm not gonna polish it up or anything like that. That's just gonna disappear. So I think it's time to put the engine in again, make sure this all fits exactly where we want to. And um, to do that, I'm going to have to cut off these uh, fill points on the back. So uh, let's get cutting. All right, so the radiator is in and we actually have some space. There's not a lot of space, but there's space between where the, um, the belt will go and uh, the fans. There's only gonna be one small belt, but uh, the alternator is something I'm gonna tackle in, the, uh, in another episode. And now you can see with everything taken out from underneath, there is so much more room for activities in here. That is going to make it much easier to uh, lower this whole plenum down. As I mentioned, I, I wanna get it down so it is as low as possible to clear the bonnet line. And uh, I think this is going to uh, make a lot more space. Well, this week I spent a lot of time uh, planning out. As I said, I spent a full day planning um, the, the way I'm gonna plumb this whole engine up, which is, uh, quite complicated but we have the radiator fans done installed uh i'm quite happy with that we're getting there guys but uh, that's all the time today so that means it's time for fun facts with mrs jeff hey guys in 1980 the president of alfa romeo signed a memorandum with the nissan motor company in japan to work on a joint venture Ana Alfa Romeo Nissan Auto Vecoli was built in an effort to bolster Alfa Romeo's sales. Alfa Romeo had a cult following but was losing money and it was also seen as a way for Nissan to gain a foothold into the European market. During this period, European manufacturers were guarding their domestic sales and blocking Japanese imports for fear of the cheaper Japanese cars overtaking the market. The Ana was seen as a way around this. It was based on the Nissan Pulsar body built in Japan then shipped to Italy, where it was assembled by Alfa Romeo with the drivetrain carried over from the Alfa Sud. 
The plan was for this car to compete in the lucrative family hatchback market, but this was not to be. The car took the worst aspects of both manufacturers, with a rust-prone body and poor mechanical reliability and Italian build quality. By 1986, Alfa was losing money fast and was bought by Fiat, whose first decision was to cease production of the Arna, which took place in 1987. All right, that's a, uh, another good big job marked off the list, getting that uh, radiator shroud made up and the fans, but uh, most of it was, uh, as I mentioned, is all the planning. Um, a lot of that I couldn't really plan until you get it in there and try and work out what space I've got and where I'm going to put things and how I'm going to um, make things fit in that tiny little engine bay. But we're, we're making good progress. I'm, I'm quite happy. When do you think you'll be able to drive it? Don't ask me that. Like a year? <laughs> Six months? Well, it's going to be a Five while. Five years? It's going to be a while. <laughs> this is not a quick project. But it's anyway. a fun one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, please like and subscribe if you um, haven't already, and you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram, Patreon uh, as well. And yes, lots of videos thank you so much to all our Patreons for supporting Jeff's tools. Yes, yes, I'm still looking for a mill and a lathe. So, uh, any of you know of any in Sydney that uh, that, are, that are going that are running going to run on two forty volts? Let me know. Uh, contact me. All right, guys. Well, uh, that is it for this week. We'll see you on the next one. <laughs> guys. President, sorry. European manufacturers were guarding. Guarding. Dover from the Alfa Romeo Sud. Is it just Alfa Sud? Alfa Sud. It was assembled by Alfa Romeo with the drive-in carried over. Okay. Assembled by Alfa Romeo. What did I say? Alfa Romeo. Ah!